By a Thread, Chapter 6, Befriending the Constitution Captain Moroni was not a statesman, nor was he a pacifist. He was a simple man who valued the principles of liberty and self-government, and who was willing to lay down his life for this cause. He valued life so much that he willingly allowed his enemies to go free by trusting them to keep their word, which many did not. And Moroni was a strong and a mighty man. He was a man of a perfect understanding, yea, a man that did not delight in bloodshed, a man whose soul did joy in the liberty and the freedom of his country, and his brethren from bondage and slavery. Yea, a man whose heart did swell with thanksgiving to his God for the many privileges and blessings which he bestowed upon his people, a man who did labor exceedingly for the welfare and safety of his people. Yea, and he was a man who was firm in the faith of Christ, and he had sworn with an oath to defend his people, his rights, and his country, and his religion, even to the loss of his blood. Now the Nephites were taught to defend themselves against their enemies, even to the shedding of blood, if it were necessary. Yea, and they were also taught never to give an offense. Yea, and never to raise the sword, except it were against an enemy, except it were to preserve their lives. And this was their faith, that by doing so, God would prosper them in the land. Or in other words, if they were faithful in keeping the commandments of God, that he would prosper them in the land, yea, warn them to flee, or to prepare for war, according to their danger. And also, that God would make it known unto them whither they should go to defend themselves against their enemies, and by so doing the Lord would deliver them. And this was the faith of Moroni, and his heart did glory in it, not in the shedding of blood, but in doing good, in preserving his people, yea, in keeping the commandments of God yea, and resisting iniquity. The Nephites understood the non-aggression principle. In contrast with pacifism, they were taught that forcible defense is justifiable. This same principle was taught to the Latter-day Saints in Joseph Smith's day through a revelation which the Lord gave to Joseph in response to the persecution which they had experienced in Missouri in 1833. This revelation and admonition is found in the 98th section of the Doctrine and Covenants and if such is of such great importance that it must in its entirety be quoted here. Brief commentary has been inserted at key points. Verily I say unto you, my friends, fear not. Let your hearts be comforted. Yea, rejoice evermore and in everything give thanks. Waiting patiently on the Lord for your prayers have entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, and are recorded with this seal and testament. The Lord hath sworn and decreed that they shall be granted. Therefore he giveth this promise unto you, with an immutable covenant that they shall be fulfilled, and all things wherewith you have been afflicted shall work together for your good. And to my name's glory saith the Lord. And now verily I say unto you concerning the laws of the land, it is my will that my people should observe to do all things whatsoever I command them. And that law of the land which is constitutional, supporting that principle of freedom in maintaining rights and privileges, belongs to all mankind and is justifiable before me. Therefore, I the Lord justify you and your brethren of my church in befriending that law which is the constitutional law of the land. And as pertaining to law of man, Whatsoever is more or less than this cometh of evil. The United States Constitution is the law of the land which the Lord granted the Latter-day Saints to obey, honor, and sustain, so long as their presidents, rulers, and magistrates likewise uphold it. But presidents, senators, and elected representatives do not always obey, honor, and sustain the Constitution. Many have it in their hearts to change and to corrupt the law for their benefit, hence coming from evil. Founding Father James Madison wrote, If it be asked, what is to restrain the House of Representatives from making legal discriminations in favor of themselves and a particular class of society, I answer, the genius of the whole system, 
the nature of just and constitutional laws, and above all, the vigilant and manly spirit which actuates the people of America. A spirit which nourishes freedom and is nourished by it, if this spirit shall ever be so far debased as to tolerate a law not obligatory on the legislature as well as on the people, the people will be prepared to tolerate anything but liberty. Such will be the relation between the House of Representatives and their constituents. This applies as well to local and state elected officials, such as governors, state senators, and state legislators. All are duty-bound to uphold their oaths of office to support and defend the Constitution against all foreign and domestic enemies. I, the Lord God, make you free. Therefore, ye are free indeed, and the law also maketh you free. Nevertheless, when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Wherefore, honest men and wise men should be sought for diligently, and good men and wise men ye should observe to uphold Otherwise, whatsoever is less than these cometh of evil. And I give unto you a commandment, that ye shall forsake all evil, and cleave unto all good, that ye shall live by every word which proceedeth forth out of the mouth of God. For he will give unto the faithful line upon line, precept upon precept, and I will try you and prove you herewith. And whoso layeth down his life in my cause, for my name's sake shall find it again, even life eternal. Therefore, be not afraid of your enemies, for I have decreed in my heart, saith the Lord, that I will prove you in all things, whether you will abide in my covenant, even unto death, that you may be found worthy. For if ye will not abide in my covenant, ye are not worthy of me. Therefore, renounce war and proclaim peace and seek diligently to turn the hearts of the children to their fathers, and the hearts of the fathers to the children. God does not mince words. He does not condone aggression. Instead, he expects his covenant people to love their enemies, to bless their enemies that curse them, and to pray for their enemies which persecute them. But God did not grant to us our liberty, to squander it on vain pursuits, idleness, and speculations, investments, to elevate ourselves above others. He expects us to abide in our covenant even unto death. Serving mammon instead of God is not forsaking all evil. Instead, it props up and expands Babylon. Hugh Nibley wrote, Elders of Israel are greedy after the things of this world, if you ask them if they are ready to build up the kingdom of God, their answer is prompt. Why, to be sure we are, with our whole souls, but we want first to get so much gold, speculate and get rich, and then we can help the church considerably. We will go to California and get gold, go and buy goods and get rich, trade with the emigrants, build a mill, make a farm, get a large herd of cattle, and then we can do a great deal for Israel. I have heard this many times from friends and relatives, but it is hokum. What they are saying is, if God will give me a million dollars, I will let him have a generous cut of it. And so they pray and speculate and expect the Lord to come through for them. He won't do it. And again I command thee that thou shalt not covet thine own property. DNC 1926. Let them repent of all their sins and of all their covetous desires before me, saith the Lord. For what is property unto me, saith the Lord. DNC 117, verse 4. He does not need our property or our help. Every rhetorician knows that his most effective weapons by far are labels. He can demolish the opposition with simple and devastating labels such as communism, socialism, or atheism, paupery, militarism, or Mormonism or give his clients' worst crimes a religious glow with noble labels such as integrity, old-fashioned honesty, tough-mindedness, or free competitive enterprise. You can get away with anything if you just wave the flag, a business partner of my father once told me. He called that patriotism. But the label game reaches its all-time peak of skill and effrontery in the Madison Avenue master stroke 
of pasting the lovely label of Zion on all the most typical institutions of Babylon. Zion's loans, Zion's real estate, Zion's used cars, Zion's jewelry, Zion's supermarket, Zion's auto wrecking, Zion's outdoor advertising, Zion's gun shop, Zion's land and mining, Zion's development, Zion's securities. All that is quintessentially Babylon now masquerades as Zion. Furthermore, renouncing war and proclaiming peace is paramount in seeking to establish the cause of Zion, which Isaiah foresaw established in the last days. God does not necessarily want religious people performing rote duties. He wants to redeem them, to bring them out of the world and back into his presence as he did with Enoch and his people. This was his intention in freeing the ancient Israelites from Egypt's rule. This was his intention with the Latter-day Saints through Joseph Smith. And this is his intention before he returns to rule and to reign in glory on the earth. Spencer W. Kimball explained, In spite of our delight in defining ourselves as modern and our tendency to think we possess a sophistication that no people in the past ever had, in spite of these things, we are, on the whole, an idolatrous people, a condition most repugnant to the Lord. We are a warlike people, easily distracted from our assignment of preparing for the coming of the Lord. When enemies rise up, we commit vast resources to the fabrication of gods of stone and steel, ships, planes, missiles, fortifications, and depend on them for protection and deliverance. When threatened, we become anti-enemy instead of pro-kingdom of God. We train a man in the art of war and call him a patriot. Thus, in the manner of Satan's counterfeit of true patriotism, perverting the Savior's teaching, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven." We ought to become devoted disciples of Jesus Christ by doing all the things he said to do in his Sermon on the Mount during his mortal ministry. And again the hearts of the Jews unto the prophets, and the prophets unto the Jews, lest I come and smite the whole earth with a curse, and all flesh be consumed before me. Let not your hearts be troubled, for in my Father's house are many mansions, and I have prepared a place for you, and where my Father and I am, there ye shall be also. Behold, I the Lord am not well pleased with many who are in the church at Kirtland, for they do not forsake their sins and their wicked ways, the pride of their hearts and their covetousness, and all their detestable things, and observe the words of wisdom and eternal life which I have given unto them. Verily I say unto you that I the Lord will chasten them, and will do whatsoever I list, if they do not repent and observe all things whatsoever I have said unto them. And again I say unto you, If you observe to do whatsoever I command you, I the Lord will turn away all wrath and indignation from you, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Now I speak unto you concerning your families. If men will smite you or your families once, and ye bear it patiently, and revile not against them, neither seek revenge, ye shall be rewarded. But if ye bear it not patiently, it shall be accounted unto you as being meted out as a just measure unto you. And again, if your enemy shall smite you the second time, and you revile not against your enemy, and bear it patiently, your reward shall be an hundredfold. And again, if he shall smite you the third time, and ye bear it patiently, your reward shall be doubled unto you fourfold. And these three testimonies testimonies shall stand against your enemy if he repent not and shall not be blotted out and now verily i say unto you if that enemy shall escape my vengeance that he be not brought into judgment before me then ye shall see to it that ye warn him in my name that he come no more upon you neither upon your family even your children's children unto the third and fourth generation and then, if he shall come upon you, or your children, or your children's children, unto the third and fourth generation, I have delivered thine enemy into thine hands. And then, if thou wilt spare him, thou shalt be rewarded for thy righteousness, and also thy children, and thy children's children, unto the third and fourth generation. 
Nevertheless, thine enemy is in thine hands, and if thou rewardest him according to his works, thou art justified. If he has sought thy life, and thy life is endangered by him, thine enemy is in thine hands, and thou art justified. Behold, this is the law I gave unto my servant Nephi, and thy fathers Joseph, and Jacob, and Isaac, and Abraham, and all my ancient prophets and apostles. It is not difficult to conceive the notion that Nephi likewise gave this law to his successors who appointed men like Captain Moroni to defend his people and their liberty so that they may worship God freely. When Nephi fabricated many swords for his people, it was not to pillage and to plunder, nor was it to defend to the death their riches. His sole purpose in preparing for wars was for the defense of his people against the Lamanites who continually sought to destroy them. Nephi never intended his people to engage in offensive wars. And again, this is the law that I gave unto mine ancients, that they should not go out unto battle against any nation, kindred, tongue, or people, save I the Lord commanded them. And if any nation, tongue, or people should proclaim war against them, they should first lift a standard of peace unto that people, nation, or tongue. And if that people did not accept the offering of peace, neither the second nor the third time they should bring these testimonies before the Lord. Then I, the Lord, would give unto them a commandment and justify them in going out to battle against that nation, tongue, or people. And I, the Lord, would fight their battles and their children's battles and their children's children's until they had avenged themselves on all their enemies to the third and fourth generation. Behold, this is an end sample unto all people, saith the Lord your God for justification before me. And again, verily I say unto you, if after thine enemy has come upon thee the first time, he repent and come unto thee, praying thy forgiveness, thou shalt forgive him, and shalt hold it no more as a testimony against thine enemy, and so on unto the second and third time. And as oft as thine enemy repenteth of the trespass wherewith he trespassed against thee, thou shalt forgive him until seventy times seven. And if he trespass against thee, and repent not the first time, nevertheless thou shalt forgive him. And if he trespass against thee the second time, and repent not, nevertheless thou shalt forgive him. And if he trespass against thee the third time, and repent not, thou shalt also forgive him. But if he trespass against thee the fourth time, thou shalt not forgive him, but shalt bring these testimonies before the Lord, and they shall not be blotted out until he repent and reward thee fourfold in all things wherewith he has trespassed against thee. And if he do this, thou shalt forgive him with all thine heart. And if he do not this, I the Lord will avenge thee of thine enemy an hundredfold, and upon his children, and upon his children's children, of all them that hate me unto the third and fourth generation. But if the children shall repent, or the children's children, and turn to the Lord their God with all their hearts, and with all their might, mind, and strength, and restore fourfold for all their trespasses wherewith they have trespassed, or wherewith their fathers have trespassed, or their fathers' fathers, then thine indignation shall be turned away, and vengeance shall no more come upon them, saith the Lord thy God, and their trespass shall never be brought any more as a testimony before the Lord against them. Amen. Jesus Christ was born into this world to suffer his Father's will. He became the standard that everyone should emulate. All serious disciples of Jesus Christ today should likewise be willing to suffer his will, turning the other cheek, forgiving seventy times seven, and blessing their enemies. Latter-day Saints should not use the war chapters of the Book of Mormon to justify supporting the troops who engage in unconstitutional wars. It is important to learn from the example of Captain Moroni and all those who fought with him in defense and only in defense of their freedom, religion, peace, wives, and their children at home. The Lord declared in verse 38 above that what he declared was an ensample unto all people, not just the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We believe that all men are bound to sustain and uphold the respective governments in which they reside, while protected in their inherent and inalienable rights by the laws of such governments, and that sedition and rebellion are unbecoming every citizen thus protected, and should be punished accordingly, 
and that all governments have a right to enact such laws as in their own judgments are best calculated to secure the public interest, at the same time, however, holding sacred the freedom of conscience. Unless we are protected in our inherent and inalienable rights, we are not obligated to sustain and uphold a corrupt government or its unconstitutional laws. But we now live in perilous times when our liberty and our inalienable rights are being stripped away piecemeal. Or rather, many of us are voluntarily surrendering our rights to despots who are pretending to keep us safe. We have a moral obligation to prevent this encroaching tyranny before we find ourselves utterly unable to peacefully resist. But, while most of us are not appointed to be defenders of peace by the sword like Captain Moroni, it is regardless incumbent upon us to be vigilant defenders and preservers of liberty. If it were so, despots and kingmen would have no chance to take public office, whether national or local. Yea, verily, verily, I say unto you, if all men had been, and were, and ever would be, like unto Moroni, behold, the very powers of hell would have been shaken for ever. Yea, the devil would never have power over the hearts of the children of men. For the reader unfamiliar with the Book of Mormon, it should be noted that Captain Moroni is not the same Moroni, the son of Mormon, who abridged the entire record. The prophet historian Mormon seemed so impressed with Captain Moroni that he gave his son the name, same name to encourage him to keep in remembrance his duty to God and his people. Moroni, the son of Mormon, at the end of the record, exhorts the reader to be wiser than they were. Because of, his, because of the failures of the peoples in the Book of Mormon to ultimately maintain their liberty, we are given a great warning. And now, I, Moroni, do not write the manner of their oaths and combinations, for it hath been made known unto me that they are had among all people, and they are had among the Lamanites, and they have caused the destruction of this people of whom I am now speaking, and also the destruction of the people of Nephi, and whatsoever nation shall uphold such secret combinations to get power and gain, until they shall spread over the nation, behold, they shall be destroyed. For the Lord will not suffer that the blood of his saints, which shall be shed by them, shall always cry unto him from the ground for vengeance upon them, and yet he avenge them not. Wherefore, O ye Gentiles, it is wisdom in God that these things should be shown unto you, that thereby ye may repent of your sins, and suffer not that these murderous combinations shall get above you, which are built up to get power and gain, and the work, yea, even the work of destruction, come upon you. Yea, even the sword of the justice of the eternal God shall fall upon you to your overthrow and destruction, if ye shall suffer these things to be. Wherefore, the Lord commandeth you, when ye shall see these things come among you, that ye shall awake to a sense of your awful situation, because of this secret combination which shall be among you. Or woe be unto it, because of the blood of them who have been slain, for they cry from the dust for vengeance upon it, and also upon those who built it up. For it cometh to pass that whoso built it up seeketh to overthrow the freedom of all lands, nations, and countries, and it bringeth to pass the destruction of all people, for it is built up by the devil who is the father of all lies, even that same liar who beguiled our first parents, yea, even that same liar who hath caused man to commit murder from the beginning who hath hardened the hearts of men, that they have murdered the prophets, and stoned them, and cast them out from the beginning. Wherefore, I, Moroni, am commanded to write these things, that evil may be done away, and that the time may come that Satan may have no power upon the hearts of the children of men, but that they may be persuaded to do good continually, that they may come unto the fountain of all righteousness and be saved. It has often been said that the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. It can be argued that it was not only the materialistic and covetous Nephites who sought wealth and comfort that supported the Gadianton robbers in their quest for power, but it was also the slothful Nephites, too preoccupied with their personal lives that allowed evil to overthrow their entire nation. Although they were once prosperous, people favored of the Lord, it was through their disobedience to Him and also their indolence that led to their extinction. 
The Nephites did build the Gadianton robbers up and support them, beginning at the more wicked part of them, until they had overspread all the land of the Nephites, and had seduced the more part of the righteous, until they had come down to believe in their works and partake of their spoils, and to join with them in their secret murders and combinations. And thus they did obtain the sole management of the government, insomuch that they did trample under their feet, and smite, and rend, and turn their backs upon the poor, and the meek, and the humble followers of God. And seeing the people in a state of such awful wickedness, and those Gadianton robbers filling the judgment seats, having usurped the power and authority of the land, laying aside the commandments of God, and not in the least the right before him, doing no justice unto the children of men, condemning the righteous because of their righteousness, letting the guilty and the wicked go unpunished because of their money, and moreover, to be held in office at the head of government, to rule and do according to their wills, that they might get gain and glory of the world, and moreover, that they might the more easily commit adultery and steal and kill and do according to their own wills. Charles Nibley explained almost a century ago, paraphrasing Joseph Smith, that the time would come when through secret organizations taking the law into their own hands and not being governed by law or even by due process of law, but becoming a law unto themselves that the Constitution of the United States would be so torn and rent asunder and life and property and peace and security would be held of so little value that the Constitution would, as it were, hang by a thread. But he never said, so far as I have heard, that that thread would be cut. I believe with Elder Richards that this Constitution will be preserved, but it will be preserved very largely in consequence of what the Lord has revealed and what this people, through listening to the Lord and being obedient, will help to bring about to stabilize and give permanency and effect to the Constitution itself. That also is our mission.